let's see here. Okay, it looks like we're live. All right, so I'm here with close friend and international trumpet soloist Vince DiMartino. Vince, how's it going, man? Great. How's so how's life? <laughs> Great. Lots of time to practice. Try out mouthpieces. Try all kinds of great stuff. Uh, survey new pieces. Survey old pieces. Look at old pieces that maybe you hadn't given a chance before. And it's great. It's always good to, there's always something to do. You know, it's, if, if, you're, if you're home, you can either sit there and nap all day or you can do something good like cooking and, you know, like playing trumpet, talking to friends on the phone. It's great. Yeah, that sounds like a good time. I know here it's kind of crazy because, uh, you know, with three kids working through different uh, school packets and doing all that stuff, and uh, it can be a little chaotic. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, uh, as we talked about earlier, there'll be questions coming in um, and just to seeing what everyone wants to talk about. Um, but the first question that everyone's always asking is, you know, how has your daily routine, routine changed since now you're forced to stay home? Well, uh, actually, it's, it's uh, similar, you know, because I get up pretty early always. I, I'm usually up at by 5.30, 6, and then I make breakfast. You know, that's everything for my wife and I. And uh, then sometimes when she's getting finished ready for work, I go right downstairs and I warm up. I'll do some mouthpiece work. Uh, I'll do some lead pipe work. I, I start to do some bending exercises, which which for me is is sort of maintenance. You know, it's it's sort of uh, just to keep myself so that I'm on the right straight and narrow. And, uh, and I do that for maybe a half an hour. You know, and then I start looking at stuff. I take care of email and and those kinds of things. You know, so th th it's a it's a whole you know, uh, a package of a day, not just trumpet. It's, it's all, all the things we have to do. And then I, like I say, I'll survey, I'll go on the internet and find some pieces or I'll go into my, my library, which has thousands of pieces. And I'll, you know, just kind of shuffle through stuff. Etude books, I'll say, geez, you know, I haven't played out of that etude book in a long time where I'll say, yeah, somebody gave me that etude book five years ago and I, I really haven't, Put any time in on let me take that out today and look at it and really give it a go you know so for me and it's good sight reading uh, too which is really important my sight reading is a notch down over the last few years as i've mostly played pieces that i know so you know even when we play jobs together it takes me like 10 minutes before i start to actually organize my reading because i don't have to read you know i don't really have to and i'm now especially you're home and I guess you can record one part and play a duet with yourself. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, so, so I, I, uh, I do those uh, maintenance things and the stuff and the uh, keeping my level up in the morning. Then in the afternoons, uh, I usually play uh, some of those things that I looked at in the morning. I'll try to play through them. I'll figure out what instruments to use. I'm always trying to figure out ways to make, you know, like recitals especially. I do a lot of concerts, obviously. And so, uh, you know, whether it's a recital, I usually don't do whole recitals anymore. It get, it's getting a little more challenging. <laughs> so I, I kind of, I might do one hard piece and then two not so hard pieces. And I feel, I feel uh, com really comfortable with that. Or if I have to do two hard pieces in one, I choose wisely. So that, you know, you know the worst thing you want to do is, you know, as you get older is you want to play trumpet, go out there and make people feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't do anything. It, it, it defeats the purpose of doing it, you know. So basically, I, I try to choose my literature now. Is, you know, I listen to some of the recordings. I just, there actually, there's a recording somewhere of me doing the Brandenburg in 1976. I just saw it the other day and I said, gee, man, I didn't know how to play that at all back then. I, <laughs> I played almost every note right, you know. <laughs> and, and, and it was too loud and I, I, you know, the balance, well, the balance, I don't know whose fault that was, you know, because based on how they made us sit and everything, but, but it's, you know, it was there and I said, well, gee, that was, that was, boy, I, I really play that a lot differently now. Thank goodness, you know, and, and it was still a good performance for, you know, as, from the standpoint of it was acceptable, but now, you know, the last recording I did, which was probably, oh boy, uh, 20 
No, it's about 10 years ago now. And that was the last time I did it because it, it really was, I thought it was a good encapsulated version of of what I wanted to sound like and what the piece should sound like. Yeah. And so I said, and now that I'm so, what I, I was 63 or something like that, you know, 60, I said, this is probably a good time not to do it anymore. <laughs> So I, so I don't, you know, because, you know, it, was, it wasn't it was really hard for me. But at the same time, I said, well, I don't want to get asked to do it five years down the road. And, and I'm probably not going to be as, you know, it's not going to be as easy. So yeah. Better. And if Herbert Clark had quit at 50, so can I. I'm <laughs> 70. <laughs> so when you practice at home, how do you balance literature or exercises? You know, how much of each do you play on a daily basis? I do more exercises than I do literature. And the only reason is because most of the literature I play, I'm familiar with, or I've been practicing small bits of it over uh, a few weeks or a month or something. Most of the pieces, you know, uh, uh, in a perfect world, uh, you shouldn't have to practice many of the pieces too much, except to figure out how you want to play them. You know, if, if you have to practice how to use a saw to make a different cut, every time you have a different cut to make, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just not, that's not fun, you know, but if you're, if you're always developing your individual practice, uh, your ability to play the trumpet as a whole, uh, you won't come across a lot of things that are uh, out of the realm of what you've been practicing. So you have to be ready for anything. And then, uh, you know, even transposing. I mean, I, I practice that a little bit now. I, I take some old pieces. What I do is I take pieces that I know and I keep my ear really well tuned so that the fingers almost move automatically so that when I do play a church job or, or something, I can pick up my E flat trumpet and play uh, maybe a part that's in the second service that was easy in the first service. It doesn't feel like it's going to be easy in the second service. I can pick up the E flat trumpet and play it on that and it's, it's easier. So, so yeah, the skills based things are, are more important. And then usually the music du jour is in the afternoon, which means like and now I don't have any worry about any concerts, but I'm doing some online things. So I'm playing some unaccompanied pieces and things like that. But uh, so in the afternoons, I'd practice movements of pieces. All right. I uh, sometimes I'll, I'll uh, uh, photocopy the whole piece and I'll cut out the parts that are challenging. And I'll practice those until they become almost like autopilot, you know, so that they're, I, my finger, I, everything just moves to it. Body, the air, everything's working together. When I get to those licks, I'm not as, uh, you know, tense about them because I've overplayed play those. And then late, the last thing I do is go through pieces as a whole. So I always feel better at a concert than I do when I play the pieces uh, at home. Because I've played them, I've, I've played them much later into my my performance day. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of trick myself into feeling better. <laughs> That's okay. So you mentioned, you know, the ability to be ready for anything. So years ago, when you played, you know, with symphony orchestras, Cincinnati, and many others, you know, how'd you balance? So like in the first half, you had to play classical, and then the second half, you do pops lead. So how'd you balance that? And you didn't get the music beforehand. Most of the time, I, the only time they ever sent me something was when it was challenging, really, really had to be really challenging. So otherwise, I just show up there with all my horns and hope I had all the right mutes and all the right horns. And, uh, you know, and usually I only use one, but but sometimes, I mean, you know, you, you pick up the piccolo trumpet and it makes something real easy. <laughs> the beginning of the Mel Torme Christmas album was recorded in April, April 1st, uh, whenever that, rec of that year that we did that. And I, you know, I, I just did what I normally do. I, I, uh, I take all my horns, throw them in the bags and the mutes and, you know, all the stuff I need and valve oil and show up at the sessions. And since this particular session was way different because there's no concert because it's April and it's a Christmas concert and they're trying to record the music so they can sell the CD in the fall. Right, yeah. So they have to get the re music recorded in the spring. 
So, you know, we showed up and and uh, Mel Torme was there actually, and you know, we didn't. It was all done as a like a concert almost, you know, but on the stage, just being recording pieces. So we record. Cincinnati had a really has a really neat way of recording. They're very very efficient when we were doing with Kunzel. You'd record two. Most of the pieces for the pops were, are short. They're three to five minutes. You know, they're they're just, they're just selections. Like you know, mm -hmm. sometimes occasionally it's a longer suite, but we do the pieces inside of it. You know, so everything was maybe you know three to five minutes. So you record two of those, then you stop. And in the meantime, the the producer, uh, Elaine Martone at the time, she's unbelievable. She's already marked all the places that need to be re-recorded. And then Eric would come into the sound booth and listen. And he'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, we need to, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. We also need to do this. Okay, she'd mark that in case that maybe he thought we, should, you know, needed to do. Then we'd go back and we'd only record those spots. So you didn't get a second chance at anything else. Whew. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> So you, when you were going through the first time, man, you wanted to make sure you weren't the person holding it up. Right. And, you know, most of the time I escaped, but eh, sometimes I had mistakes here and there. So then you'd record those spots, and then you'd record two more pieces in the same sitting. So you kind of piggybacked everything. And we recorded, oh, sometimes we recorded whole CDs in a session and a half, two sessions at most. Because everybody got so good at it and the concentration level C is is short so you could really be you know but you know you show up and I say oh look there's a solo in this one oh, <laughs> I didn't know I was gonna have to play a solo in this one and I mean improvise solo so you know you can't sit there trying to figure out what you're gonna play too much because they're gonna you know I usually ask them to make two takes with the solo but I, I, but I look through, boy, I, I tell you what, you study for like, you could, you know, you get there. I was always early, at least an hour, and I'd look through everything. So I'd have a little time to figure out stuff, you know, but that's all the time you get. If you can't play it, if it's something you, you figured it out, but it's too hard for you to play, well, that's not going to help. It's just going to make you more nervous. Yeah. But that skill comes in of being ready for what you don't know. And, and so... But the, but the, you know, that's why they call you to do these things. You know, like somebody like, like a Wayne Bergeron and Gary Grant and Tony Cadillac in New York and Glenn Drews and all those people. I mean, they show up, you know, uh, John uh, Lewis, you know, and Malcolm, Nab, Malcolm McNabb was like that, Conrad Gazzo, all the players that you hear about and you've seen their names on either recordings or concert programs and things, that's a skill they had. Rafael Mendez was in the studios for a while, MGM, uh, and, uh, you know, and he was one of those players. He could just play anything. So he was a valuable asset. So basically, you know, and it's also a challenge. It also puts you on the spot, and I always like that. I always like to be put on the spot, as long as it was reasonable, you know. It's something mm -hmm. you could, you know, it wasn't out of the realm of what a trumpet could do. But, yeah, so, so uh that's why it's good to, to, to be ready because you just don't know what's going to come up. The very first thing in that session, as I was talking about, it was the uh, uh, Christmas, you know, like the Christmas festival. Okay, great. You say, oh, great, Christmas festival. Oh, this is going to be great. I know this. Well, only trouble was it was up a fifth. Ooh. So instead of G, I'm talking... <laughs> F. The first note was high D. D. Oof. So I did it twice, you know, like I cracked a different note each time. <laughs> and I reached down, picked up my B5 piccolo. I said, okay, let's do it again. And then I did it twice, just nails. Because it was easy. Right. I had a tool in the box. You know, the last thing you want to do is put, be playing that thing on a, on a B-flat trumpet. Even a C trumpet doesn't work very well. So, you know, you bring whatever horns you, you need uh, that you can cover. And I had mutes, too. I had piccolo mutes with me. And I had things, because Mel Torme arranged a lot of the music himself. But, you know, he wasn't, you know, he put like a high C sharp, right? 
for the cup here. <laughs> well, that's that's a 50 50 lick, you know. Yeah, while the strings are going, you know, they're playing real soft. You have to go, <laughs> but with a, with, a, with a piccolo trumpet with this cup mute in, just do it, no problem. Yeah. So so gear so gearing up for like gigs like that you had to practice of course you know uh, piccolo B flat C E flat whatever so on a daily basis did you practice every horn every single day? Uh, not every day but every week. Uh, B flat and C almost every day always still B flat and C and uh, E flat uh, once or twice a week piccolo trumpet I used to play it a lot more because uh, it was used a lot more. Now it's sort of in a doldrums now, you know, you, and then all of a sudden, you know, it'll be, it'll be the uh, Mannheim Steamroller Christmas album all over again, and you'll be playing piccolo trumpet and every other piece, you know, and stuff like that. So you got to just keep up. But the main thing is that the, the, uh, the embouchure, our face, our, our air, all of that, it takes the same air and stuff to play the same pitch. The same, you know, maybe not as loud on a piccolo and all that, but the same vibrations are going through the harmonic series. So, yeah, it doesn't take much to play each horn and feel comfortable on it. Get about you want to find the, you really do it for the sound. So if I'm playing a, like a piccolo, and it's really supposed to be like a uh, a real soft uh, high part on a B flat trumpet. Well, I'll play a big mouthpiece on the piccolo. See. So that it at least has a lot some of the lower harmonics, even though the bell's not set up for low harmonics, it, it just rounds it out a little more, and it's believable. It doesn't yeah. sound like a piccolo. You you blow a little bit more fuller and connecting, and and then then they can put they can change actually the uh, uh, equalization on it, and it will sound more like a B flat trumpet if it needs to be. Yeah, you could tell them that. Say yeah, you know you might want to. Put a little more of the lows in this this sound, all right? And they go, oh, okay, <laughs> really? And then they play it back for you, and you go, wow, great, that's great. So yeah, you know, you're helping them too. And a lot of times, it's really good to mention that because a lot of the people that do that are not don't really know what you're trying to do. If you are trying to use a you know a, a different horn, like I use an E flat trumpet a lot. You know, I just got that great E flat trumpet, and and and. Uh, Nobody would ever know it's an E flat trumpet. And, you know, you can play really. You can do stuff like, uh, uh, oh, uh, outdoor overture, is one of them. You can do Quiet City, by Copeland. Two of those two Copeland pieces. And nobody would ever know that it's that it's an E flat trumpet. The recording I did many years ago with organ and trumpet and English horn of uh, Quiet City. That's an E flat trumpet. Nobody's ever said, "Why did you use an E flat trumpet?" Because they don't think it's an E flat trumpet. Right. So it's a tool, and and the mouthpiece, of course, I used the big mouthpiece, and you know, I I did some some positioning of myself in the English horn. So there's you know there's lots that go into it. But the trumpet playing, you you, you don't have any chance to experiment with your trumpet playing when the session is on. So yeah. You, yeah. That part has to be. You know, you have to be confident in yourself. And the way you do that is by practicing etudes. Uh, there's some great books to do that if you're, if you're looking to play in pops things. Phil Collins wrote from Cincinnati wrote a really great book. And uh, same thing with Phil Snedeker. Uh, it's all these uh, etudes based on pieces that are in orchestra. So you have to, you, you know, you use your skills without having to practice just that one lick. Because when you practice stuff like that, you start to get phobias about certain pieces. Yes, I get that. Yeah, a lot of people tell me that. People are playing orchestras. They say, oh, man, you know, I'm going to play horn players. Oh, i got to play Beethoven second. Oh, they hate it. You know, because just because they played it once or twice before and it didn't go well. So now it's the third or fourth time they're doing it, you know, and, you know, so whatever you can do to make yourself feel confident is, is a good thing. You know, it clears up a lot of the, 
phobias you get about things. Yes. Yeah, so, so you mentioned confidence. So um, when you warm up, if you have a real tough day the day before, you had like two or three gigs or whatever, do you change your warm up the next day or how do you kind of assess the situation? Well, it depends on how much you got to do. You know, it, it, it always, it, you're always looking into the future. So if you, you're not looking into the future and you, you, you allow yourself to go too far beyond the night before, and then you're playing prayer of St. Gregory the next morning in church and you sound like, you know, there's only air coming out of your trumpet. Well, that's your fault, you know? So you have to kind of, you have to plan. We're not, we're not like uh, some instruments. They don't have to worry about any of that. Push the right key down. And if their fingers are bad though, you know, they've got to worry about it. But the instrument them th itself is, is built. It's all regulated. Ours, part of it, it has to be renewed, and every no matter how good you are of a player, you're still tearing down to some degree. Even the greatest, even an Alva Zudi, you know, he probably moves about that much. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, somebody like me, I might get down to here. Well, you know, I got to make sure that the next morning, I don't have to play really something super challenging, soft, long. Uh, you know, because uh, I won't be able to do it as well. You know, uh, there'll be moments of uh, anticipation, and uh, and that's that's what nerves are. Most most uh, most performance anxiety has to do what you know you can't do. Not worrying about if you can do it. You know, as much as you you already know if you know you can get through something, you don't worry about it. You know, and it's difficult. It's challenging even really challenging spots. I, I just almost, I could pick up a trumpet and go, da, 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 in, in the Stravinsky, Soldier's Tale. It's the very first lick you have to play, and it's below the staff. A major chord, B major chord, A major chord. Oh, no, uh, A major, E. No, it is B. A, B, A. So that I know it, I hear it, you can play it. You know you can play it. And if you miss it, you say, gee, I'm surprised I missed that. You, there's no anticipation about it. Yeah. Okay, if you haven't practiced five notes to the beat, well, a lot, you're, you're going to feel not so good about playing five notes to the beat for three beats. And you know, in your, and then you're at the first valve and you have to stop and do different rhythms with the first valve. Well, there, you, you've put a lot of, there's a lot of room for uh, failure in there. Unless, you, unless you, you're, you're confident about it, you've practiced it, you have a methodology, uh, you could play it five times in a row, so to speak, you know, and, and you still might miss it, but you don't feel like that. Yeah. Because, and that's, that's an important part of performance. Uh, you know, stability is knowing that you're prepared, you know, pre preparation. The You know, it's really weird for me. Uh, the hardest pieces, usually, I'm the least nervous for in the when I was younger, because I practiced them so hard, so many times that, you know, like playing Fisher Toll, second concerto. One time I had to play it twice in one day. Two performances. And then, well, I, I gave it a thought for a minute. I said, but, well, <laughs> I'm going to play real controlled in the first one. And I did, you know, and I, and there was a couple places where I fluffed a few notes, you know, and the, and the reason was because I was, you know, just being a little more protective. I said, I had the next one. Now I'm just going to play it. And it was the best one I ever played. And it was yeah. the first one. You see, so, so there's no, same thing with the Brandenburg. I've had to play the Brandenburg twice in the same day. But you got it. Most of the time, you have to at least rehearse it. They always want to go over stuff, you know. So, uh, but I had to play the kitty concerts two days in a row, two one morning and two the next morning. Yeah. And after that, I never thought or worried about the Brandenburg anymore. <laughs> no, 
went in. It was great. It was a great thing for me. It wasn't a, it wasn't a super high pressure gig. And so I knew, you know, once I finished it, I knew that I could do it. Yeah. I wasn't worried about, oh my God, there's 3,000 people out there and I hope I do well and, you know, and all that. It was just like, well, this is a kitty concert. I, you know, I wanted to really like this piece. So I played it, you know, and I also had to play, I also had to play a movement of the Haydn trumpet concerto. I also had to play a jazz piece and something else. I can't remember what it was. Something, I think on flugelhorn. So I had to do two of those back to back. They were 45 minute concerts with a 15 minute uh, break and then 45 minutes again. And it's not that long of a time, but when you're playing all those pieces and you want to be accurate for an hour and a half, you know, and I played about probably about 50 minutes out of that time. So, yeah, but, but if you feel confident, if you know you can do it. So that's why it's really important to, to, to play a lot, meaning a lot of performances, a lot of places, rehearsals that you, you use as performance. Every, I always tell Pat, I say, I, I, don't, I don't rehearse. I never rehearse. She goes, what do you mean? that? You just re I said, yeah, but maybe for other people it's a rehearsal, but for me, it's the same concentration that I use when I play the concert. Otherwise, I'm going to feel different or I'm going to want it to be better. I'm going to want it to be this or that. I said, well, I can't do that. I'm not smart enough. So basically, when I put the trumpet up, it's what I can do. You know, and, and, and the only thing I ever do uh, favor a little bit is the long run. Just trying to, the big picture, the endurance part of it or whatever, you know, that needs to be thought about. You know, show, what kind of a thing is it, you know, are we doing three concerts that day? I've done three rodeos in one day. That ain't no fun. I've never done a rodeo. Well, man, rodeos and circuses are are a thing of the past uh, almost, but man, it changes your life. Rodeos, rodeos especially, because it takes you ten minutes before you can read the music. And I'm a good reader, but when they go, okay, ready? I mean, it's all in one. All the gallops are in one. So, you know, technique, we've never went. You know, it's it's like crazy. So, 10 minutes, you you know, but, but once you've done one, you practice. You start practicing scales a week before. <laughs> Out at eights and sixteenths and what? I mean, it's crazy, but you know, it's that's how you learn. I used to take all the freshman students with me to the rodeo rehearsal, and they had them sitting back of me, and they couldn't see the music going by fast that fast. They'd say, "How are you reading that?" I said, "With great difficulty." And they'd laugh, you know, because <laughs> after the first ten minutes, I was sort of okay, you know. We'd stop a beat sometimes, and everybody was. And the conductor was really funny. He was a real nice guy. Actually, a real nice guy. His name was uh, Sh Sh Scheidler. And he, every time you messed up, he'd go, just like, because he knew how hard it was. And he knew I hated when he did that, you know, because I didn't like missing anything. So, you know, it was kind of a fun. But he, he really was a great, he was a very good rodeo conductor. But, uh, you know, things change. Today, you, there's not as much of that kind of, uh, pick up jobs. So some, some people feel like it's not as essential to, to have all those skills. But I'm kind of glad I, I got them because most of the other stuff I do is way easier than that. Yeah. yeah. So let's get some questions uh, people have been sending in online. Um, oh, here's a good one. Uh, do you have any favorite exercises to help with lip flexibility or lip trills? You know, lip trills, lip trills are really tongue trills. So basically you're learning how to use the harmonic series. So you, you're actually, I'll show you. Let me get the water out of this. So if you, 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 first of all, you should never use valves because if you can't switch, you have to be using enough energy in your air and, and enough uh, resistance in your lip so that the notes almost move by themselves. 
So you can start, don't start too high. So let's say we're gonna, let's, we're gonna do a lip trill on an F or a, a, a shake or whatever you wanna call it. See, I used one and two for that. If you use one, if you use first thou, the next note that's higher than that is A flat. Why go a whole, a step and a half when you can go one step? See what I mean? I'm using a step lower in that range. So you can do that, or you can practice. You can just go. It almost sounds like I'm doing the right notes in the G scale, but actually. crazy intervals because of the valve combinations so if you want to if you're doing something where the where the next note matters well you probably use a different fingering you know or something like that but basically you notice I did a whole scale of lips lip trills that means that my air is active enough to change notes if you're going that means your air is way too slow and your lips are getting way too tight. They have to be, they have to kind of be flexing, like your air is moving with great uh, excitement, okay? And your lip is resisting it with great excitement. <laughs> so that, so you're not, you're not going like that unless you're trying to do one of those wide old Maynard Ferguson shakes. West Coast, we didn't do that <laughs> in New York. But, but, uh, but, but basically, so you're gonna go, See, and, 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 and just a slight movement of the tongue and an adjustment in the lips to make up for that. See, I'm not really working hard because the work is, is in the air. Everybody always says that, let the air do the work. But what does that mean? You know, I always wonder what, do, what let the air do the work. My air didn't want to work. <laughs> So, so when you when you do that and you get it correct, you have to transpose that feeling to the next intervals. See, okay. So then we go. Let's see. Let's, let's try a higher one. So basically, you see that the lip trill was in the middle of the note. So the next note, whatever it would be, I'd be able to get it. So that was from E flat to G. Right? And the last note was a high G. So, so basically, there's not different positions you play in. You only play in the lip slur position. And if you're not doing that when you're playing scales and arpeggios, then what are you going to do when you get to the lip trill note and you haven't been playing that way? You're going to miss it. You're gonna, you're gonna be, you're gonna be struggling, you know. So that once I, once I felt the top G, I had the, the, the other note had to be already there. I can't go. See, because otherwise you're gonna, even if you get the note, it's not gonna sound perfect. That one was just okay, you know. But, but. It, so when you practice these things and practice scales, um, I have exercises that I do. So that I feel like I can play the whole range of the instrument with the same kind of air, the same kind of direction, same kind of intensity. So that means then you can connect the, the notes together, which is what endurance is. Endurance is not strength, because we know there's a lot of trumpet players that can play high Gs and they can play for 10 minutes and then they can't play. So that's not endurance. <laughs> endurance is not only some strength, it's what it costs to move between notes. So if you're struggling to do a lip slur, 
That means your air is way, way too lax. It's not free enough. Everybody always says, let the air go, let the air go. Well, yeah, but it, maybe sometimes our terminology when we talk about it is not very clear. That means just open up, and then, of course, then you can't move at all. So basically, you have to get the air so that it becomes useful to move on, on the Baroque trumpet, so to speak. You know, so when you're doing, uh, like, a matter of fact, I suggest, I used to have one in my, in my teaching studio, and when people were freshmen, I'd, I'd, I'd have them teach them how to play at least a perfect fifth in, in a scale. Okay, I said, now pick up your trumpet and do exactly the same thing and push the right valve combinations down. And then you're playing trumpet correctly. The valves don't get any notes for you. All they do is connect together seven different trumpets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there are seven trumpets with a common bell and lead pipe. So everything, and I, you know, some of you know that my one rule is what? You can slur something without tonguing it, but you can't tongue something without slurring it. So that the way that your air works is the same all the time. So if you're going to go... So basically, those, those events were all exactly blown the same way. And the only addition was the tongue to the second time I did each one. With that said, going back to the question of the lip slur, if you're not able to lip slur, see that I'm already in that active position. I'm not in the the uh, what do you call that like paralyzed position that that you're if you only can play one note at a time and then you have to struggle to get to the next note well gosh that costs a lot get this water out there you go oh yeah <laughs> that's what that thing's for I, I was wondering what that was. <laughs> but uh, yeah so then when you're playing the higher ones you see you're not killing yourself doing that because the air what does everybody always say what's the most common phrase that when I was a kid the teacher would say, let the air do the work. I'd say, hell, that doesn't work for me. Well, because I wasn't using my air right. I would just force every note out, and I didn't care what it cost. You know, I'd, uh, so basically, so when I play my high C, if I'm going to do a lip trill on a high F, uh, <laughs> see, I already have it in the, in the C. And if I don't, boy, I make a pretty darn quick adjustment if I can, because I'm not going to get it. Well, you know what that feeling is like. Mm -hmm. Everybody already knows that, you know. And it's the same thing when you play like something you work on, you know, a piece that you've, you've been working on really hard. And you are. And then you go. And then you miss the note because you already dropped your support your mm -hmm. hair is working a different way and now you're saying oh my god i have to play g again and then you guess and of course it's easy to miss when you're guessing but if you're still there See, all those notes sound like they have the same tone line. They have the same tone production because the air and the reed, your lips, are interacting in a similar way. If every note has a different feel to it, that means your reed goes from being a wet noodle to a piece of sheet metal. Well, how can that sound the same? No matter how hard you practice, it isn't. It's just going to be challenging. So that's why the harmonic series, all the books, Charles Colin, uh, uh, Walter Smith, you know, uh, Lip Flexibilities books, and uh, all the different books. I mean, there's, uh, you know, just practicing in the Arbin book. 
you know. Notice I use different fingerings for the E each time, E mm -hmm. and A, because you never know when you're going to have to use that. So you want to be real efficient in your practice, always always practicing. In other words, I'm practicing when I'm playing for people, you know, and I, I guess maybe I shouldn't do that. But but, uh, <laughs> but but I'm always thinking about how I can, you know, do it. So those things in the Arben book, Schlossberg, right? Yeah. It's, it's the same stuff. You start at number 59 in the Schlossberg book. And you're doing all the ellipsler part of, of Schlossberg. I used to play those. Oh, I was terrible. Oh, my gosh. And then the, the book that really helped me the most was Charles Cohen Advanced Lip Flexibilities. Because it was the same thing over and over again in different keys all the time. And it had hard stuff in it. I mean, like, I just, oh, I'm not going to practice that. That's too hard. I, don't, I can't get that. So, okay. So stuff like that until I get it so that it's really connected because my air is one complete blow and I'm making the adjustment inside my mouth that trusts me, myself, to just keep blowing and to keep adjusting until I get it right. Don't just try to get the right notes. Try to get the feel right. And then you'll, it's like throwing a baseball. You know, you just keep, and finally, you go, oh, yeah, man. Strike zone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Strike zone again. Yeah. You've seen pitchers get into the, they get into the, you know, the, their zone. Man, they can't, they strike out 10 batters in a row. And then somebody luckily hits the ball next. And it, it almost breaks their concentration. It was so easy. You know, so it's the same thing in trumpet playing or any music playing. You know, if you, if you have a anticipation of success, there's a pretty good chance you're going to be successful. If you have anticipation of failure all the time because of the way you practice, it's not a not a good thing, you know. Yeah, that's good stuff. Question. Let's see. We got some gear questions coming in. A um, uh, question about the Gabriel uh, Blackburn B flat trumpet. So, what was it like uh, helping design that trumpet and just describe that process? Well, you know. Well, you, first of all, you got to have people that are willing to listen to you. And that was the greatest thing was that no matter how crazy it seemed, the things I was asking, they'd say, oh, okay, let's see, let's try that. And, you know, some of the things that I'd go, oh, 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 that wasn't a very good idea, was it? Say, oh, no, let's try something else. They didn't say how bad I was, you know, how stupid I was. But, but basically, you know, I, and then I would say, you know, I was thinking about this certain thing. Like we came up with the, the way the lead pipe is designed. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, I, I played this instrument. And, you know, I could play the biggest mouthpiece on this and still play high S. How come? So we studied it a little bit. And then they went to work at making it happen. And that's the design of this lead pipe. And it's tremendous. I mean, it, it gives, talk about confidence. It gives me confidence. You know, and uh, any ideas about, you know, how the, 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 two, the, the slides are shaped and which ones I like, which ones. Then we also talked about the sensations that I got playing the different tuning slides and the different configurations of that. Because I'm a big believer that from here to here, the lead pipe, the, the, the uh, mouthpiece, all the way to the bow section. Is probably the most critical spot for me because I think most of the adjustments uh, some people also make an adjustment here uh, no wrong side this side no here. no here there it is <laughs> everything's backwards right here uh, some people make an adjustment here and it's either it opens there or it's smaller and so that changes the resistance uh, more slightly than the front end so, so there, you know, there's lots of ways. And of course the valve section can be different and the size of the valves. I know in, in one of my piccolo trumpets that I've had for years, we put a different size valves in it 
just a, just a hair different. And all of a sudden, he played like unbelievable. So, but you have to have people willing to try that. And when I've been, you know, working with the uh, Blackburn and, and the mouthpieces, people have picked it. Uh, you know, it's been easy. It's it's just been easy, and in, in, in spite of and most of its failures on my own part, of of, of leading them down the wrong trail almost, you know what I mean? Because that's something I wanted. They wanted to see if it was something good. So that there's a learning process in both ends. That means that both people are going to be a lot smarter in the future. Yeah. That's, that's what's important. If, you know, if you go to a, a certain person, they say, well, I make shoes, but for this size. So you have to learn to get your feet to fit in them. <laughs> I mean, you can only take so much of them. Yeah. And, and, and you know, you, you, in the meantime, you're trying to cut your feet down to fit into smaller shoes or bigger shoes or something. You're trying to stuff paper in there so you can wear the shoes. So it just doesn't work. I mean, I've, I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> and I'm happily doing it. And I've done it with a lot of nice people from all different companies, really. But, you know, some people are not as... Uh, comfortable with moving out of their their comfort zone so you you, you know you you uh, when you when you have people that have confidence in themselves and they have confidence in you that's a that's a, a very uh, uh, it makes things move a lot faster you know so that that's a, that's a, uh, you know catalytic type of a thing things move a lot faster it moves along where you're trying to get because you're both not afraid to say, hey, that was a stupid move on my part, you know? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's just the uh, same thing with mouthpieces. A lot of times, the same thing. When I talk to Peter. He's always willing to try something, even though it most likely won't work. We're still going to try it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really funny. And I call it the, the great mouthpiece crash. You know, you get this back. Oh, man, listen, I could play double high C's on this. Oh, this is the best thing that ever happened. And 10 days later, you're going... <laughs> your lips are completely wasted because the equipment was too challenging. It was open and it responded really good, but your physical, my phys, my physical self, was not able to to sustain that day to day. It was almost like digging down into a, a ditch, you know. And and almost every trumpet player ends up in the ditch at some point or another for whatever reason, not necessarily just mouthpieces and horns. The amount you play, what you what you practice, all of those things. But, you know, I, I've been playing basically, I've been playing this horn. How long, Eric? Two years? Three. Uh, the prototype's probably probably close to three years now. Yeah. And we really haven't changed much of anything on it. Uh, it mouthpiece adjustments, but yeah. Mouthpiece adjustments, little gap adjustments, and, you know, stuff like that. And, and, uh, and I've changed because I wanted to get a nicer sound and, something that if I put a different mouthpiece in and, uh, you know, like, like this one, I don't have to do anything except put a different mouthpiece in. So that basically I can switch between these two mouthpieces with this horn, and it feels like I'm playing the same deal. Well, that's important if you're going to pick up a piccolo trumpet or if you're going to all of a sudden have to play a lead thing and the next piece. You know, you're playing fourth trumpet, as, as uh, Eric was saying before, I'm playing. Man, that's the worst lick in the whole world. That's the uh, fourth the second trumpet part to Symphony Fantastique. And that's what I had to do because I was the fourth trumpet in the first half. <laughs> the whole set of mouthpieces I had to use for this gig. And then the second half was lead trumpet with uh, Ella Fitzgerald. So what do you do? Well, you do the best you can. <laughs> but if you, if you have a, if I would have had this, it would have been a lot easier, you know, with, with this because I would be prepared more and, and I'd feel more comfortable. And of course that results in you having more confidence and playing better. And mm -hmm. that's what they're all trying to do. And, and trust me, 
it isn't only the horn. It, it, you know, it's the way we practice. It's the way we practice. But if you find something that makes you feel more confident, well, it's pretty good to have. I mean, I have, I don't know. I, Eric knows I have like about 150 trumpets. And I use about 20 or 25 a year. Only I might only use it once. But that particular piece of equipment, I can't play it on this horn. I can't play it on that horn or that one or these new. I have to play it on this horn because this works. And then you just play it for the week or maybe a couple of weeks if you've got something you really have to learn on it. And, and not only that, you hear something that sounds more unique. It fits the piece. So you can't, there's no one trumpet that plays every piece of music. You know, unless you have a very uh, narrow uh, scope of the kind of music you play. If you're playing like in a, a cover band, well, you're probably going to get away with one trumpet and one mouthpiece and a flugelhorn. You know, and it's fine. I do that. Sometimes I go playing only those two instruments for two months, you know. But I practice the other ones all the time because it's their tools. And you never know when you're going to have to pick that tool up out of the box, like with that Mel Tomé thing, and, and just use it for three minutes, and your life is easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the the tools you need to you need to to start. You should always uh, when you're younger, you should always play a middle of the road mouthpiece with a middle of the road horn. You know, just whatever you you need to to learn to play. And then as you your 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 musical uh, scope broadens, well, you might need a different mouthpiece. You know, you might end up getting a cornet mouthpiece to match because you're playing a brass band as well as your, your school band. You also might play uh, in a church gig you, in, and you don't, maybe you don't want to transpose or something. If you're not a music major, you might want to get a C trumpet, you know, and play right off the hymn book. You know, so, so basically uh, there's lots of reasons to get other equipment. But, you know, if you're in a narrow scope, you can get a buy with one mouthpiece and, and one horn for, for most people. But if you're going into uh, you're a semi-professional or a professional, uh, every trumpet player is going to need at least four, four to six instruments. You know, a B flat, a C, an E flat, and a piccolo, a flugelhorn, right? And lots of yeah. music. And possibly... Uh, some other special cornet, a cornet, you know, and, and I have instruments, I think in almost every key, I have a, I have a, a G instrument that plays a 19, eight, uh, 19th century music. I have a, an A cornet that I use on old cornet solos that are with theater orchestra. I have B flat cornets, like, um, really uh, dozens of B-flat cornets to play in different uh, cor cornet style pieces in the, in the 19th century. Then I have, uh, I have an F alto trumpet, which is used for like Mahler actually in Strauss, the big long horn. And, uh, and I use these instruments, they're tools. But you know, you're, most of you are never gonna play cornet solos in A. You're not gonna, you know, so I have instruments for all these things. I have a really cool Blackbird cornet that I got that I use for just about every modern cornet thing that I do or something that I want to sound more mellow. And I'll play it on that and people almost think it's a flugelhorn because it's so beautiful. And I got a mouthpiece that's, you know, right for it and balanced so that it, I can pick it up and play it. Mm -hmm. So all these things, you know, it's, it's uh, I think it's fun myself, but. It is fun. And then you touched on it, you know, um, you know, I want to stress to everyone, you know, the balance of resistance is key. So between the player, the mouthpiece and the horn. Um, so a lot of times uh, players will, will say a big mouthpiece feels too tight, but what they're actually the sensation they're feeling is it's causing tension in their shoulders because a mouthpiece is too big. Um, so it, it's a critical balance between player mouthpiece and trumpet. And when that balance is, correct you get that compression you're looking for and the trumpet becomes easy yeah it's it, it's a lot better uh sensation on both sides of the instrument the instrument likes it better and you like it better correct <laughs> yes you know so you, you don't get the fighting sensation as much you know and of course if you don't take a good breath 
some things are not going to work it's not a perfect instrument even the greatest players you know have days when it's not you know the way they want it to be but but that's ok you know we're still playing music and we're still emotional and we're still participating playing in concerts doing little recordings with people and and stuff and playing for ceremonies we're lucky trumpet players are lucky because uh, we get to share some of the more important things that happen in the world uh, with other people, like weddings and uh, uh, funerals, you know, uh, all kinds of special events. We we announce the horse race, the Kentucky Derby. Uh, we race. We announce all the horse races as a result, you know. So so the, we we do lots of really cool things. Fanfares, you know, the king's coming. You know, you play. Da, 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 da. And if you don't play it right, well, the king's going to be pretty upset. <laughs> you get pretty good at playing fantasies. Or you could be telling somebody that the enemy's coming down the road. And you're on top of the tower in Krakow, in Poland. And But also, in the Civil War, the music, the bugler, they always tried to kill the bugler. Because that was the person that was given the signals on which way the troops should turn and everything. There weren't any, you know walkie-talkies or anything. <laughs> so basically, there had to be something they could hear. So we we take uh, part in the greatest and the worst of events uh, because we can be heard. Yeah. It's true in music, too. So we have to have both the soft side and the loud side. So it's exciting to be that person. Yeah, that's good stuff. Uh, let's see, a couple of people asked, uh, which mouthpiece are you currently playing on? The same one we designed, probably 10 when Pickett started, when Pickett Brass started, uh, I gave Peter, I don't know how many mouthpieces. That reminds me, I got to get those mouthpieces for Gabriel. Those ones that I Oh, made. yes. I forgot about them. <laughs> we'll tell, maybe Taylor will bring them. We'll see. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, you know, uh, what was I saying? I forgot. I'm getting forgetful. Uh, we were just talking about. Um... Yeah. So I would go over to Peter's and I'd say, well, could we make something that's a little bit like this? And he was working with a hand lathe. I mean, he's doing it by himself. And of course, you learn a lot that way, for sure. Just skill-wise, you know. Yeah. And and uh, so we would design out. I said, boy, that's really good. So I played one that was handmade for, oh, quite a while. And then he got his first CNC lathe and made a mouthpiece. And man, it, it was great. And now you can, that's the greatest thing I think about. I've been playing the same rim, everything. We just try little things. And time-wise, it's pretty efficient. It, you know, if it, if it took him, you know, five hours to get a mouthpiece put together and working, well, we go a lot slower in our developmental and the time it takes to develop something that you think is an improvement for you. So that's that's a good that's a good thing for me. So mouthpiece wise, I've been playing basically the same rim and uh, same style cups and uh, new newer backboards is always uh, improvements in the backboard area. So you don't have to change the whole mouthpiece. You can you can just change the backboard and it becomes a, a small change and you can see if it makes a big difference. And that's 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 great. You don't have to change anything if you like what you sound like. Heck, <laughs> you know what I mean. It's it's not it's not to uh, get you to buy a hundred mouthpieces. It's so that you can get the mouthpiece that works the best for you. Everybody has a little different way of playing. The basic formula recipe is the same, but some people like a little more sugar. Some people like more eggs in the batter. Some people like more spice. You know, so that's. That's what you're looking for, you know. And of course, you want you want it to be easy to play, the easiest you can play to get all that good taste, so to speak. Yeah. So, what, what do you prefer, brass mouthpiece top or acrylic, or do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I like I like well, I use the acrylic ones a lot. Uh, I well, if I have the one that for cancer blows, and I usually play a piece on that almost every concert, so I can talk about cancer blows and Ryan Anthony and raising money for cancer and for multiple myeloma research and all cancers really. 
And, and then uh, I also have a, a, a white plastic one that I've had for many years. It still has the numbers on it, you know, like the four numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Because I always liked it because it, it makes my B cup mouthpiece, which is a, a, a deeper cup, sound like an even deeper cup. Like the old style funnel shaped cornet mouthpieces. When you get into those, it gets a little more challenging to switch mouthpieces. And if I'm playing like, 10 or 15 different instruments in a historic brass concert, that, that could be no fun at the end. You feel like you don't have any. So I have a mouthpiece that's made out of white plastic uh, Delron, I think is what it's called. Yeah, Delron. Yeah. And, and uh, when I play it, it sounds like I'm playing a mouthpiece that's a lot more funnel shaped. And uh, so it, what it basically does, it takes the highs out a little more. Mm -hmm. And, and that's basically, I don't think it does a lot less more for the lows, except it takes the highs out. And it's the same shape as, as the, uh, the, the, the uh, one that's made out of brass. And then the backboard is uh, larger, a little bit larger. And then, you know, you, you, that's once again, it's tools. And then I have other instruments that I, you know, I have different shanks because they won't fit into these old instruments. Yeah. So I have ones that they've shaved down, ones that are batter, and, you know, it's just uh, because I have, I, once again, I have a lot of different tasks that I have to, that I want to do. And so uh, we, we set up to do that. And, and it's great. For me, it's great. I'm, I'm here in Danville, Kentucky. In 45 minutes, you're at the mouthpiece, man. <laughs> nothing quite like it. Yeah, I do, I do miss our, uh, our uh, work breakfasts. Oh yeah, we gotta get we gotta get back to work. That's yeah. Well, once we to... once we can go back to work, and everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and <laughs> the, there's a lot we can do and a lot we can't do at this point. So basically, you know, you 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 want to make sure that you're using the right equipment, and uh, and of course the the important most important thing is practicing. If you're not in, if you're can't do something at all. The mouthpiece is really going to help because it's it's something before the mouthpiece usually is making you not able to lip slur, let's say. But then once you can do that, you can find something that makes it easier to do the same thing. That's different. Yeah. The mouthpiece doesn't cure the basic fundamental technique of playing the trumpet. It enables you to refine the technique that you've been developing from pre-mouthpiece, anything before the mouthpiece, the way you use your air, your tongue position, your embouchure, you know, your, 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 your uh, position of the mouthpiece on your lips, uh, you know, and stuff like that, side to side pressure. There's so many things that you can do wrong before you even get a lick of air into the mouthpiece, you know? Yeah. So basically, that's what all those exercises your teachers want you to do are for. You know, you, 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 when you see somebody like Wayne Bergeron practicing lip slurs and arpeggios before he goes out there and plays MacArthur Park, there has to be a reason for it. He's not just giving it lip service, so to speak. Yeah. He's, he's doing it because it gives him confidence. It puts him closer and closer to where he know, needs to be to be the most accurate trumpet player that he wants to be. And uh, this is the same thing with uh, Tom Hooten in the Los Angeles Philharmonic or somebody who plays in a klezmer band if they really want to be accurate. They, their, their equipment, and getting, it gets them close to, the, the, and their exercises that they do with that equipment gets you closer. And, that, and if it makes it easier, that's what endurance is. You can play longer with the same lips so to speak, you know, so basically that's, that's what I enjoy. I enjoy, I still enjoy the process of learning and especially in a, in a period where my recipe is changing because my age is changing. So for me, I could just say, well, I can't do it as well. I'm just going to quit. <laughs> well, you don't learn anything that way. I might not play fish or toe anymore, but, <laughs> but I'm still playing things that, are challenging, like slurring an octave and knowing how to do it way better than I used to. I just used to guess, you know, and a lot of times I didn't guess very well. <laughs> uh, you know, so basically that's the daily 
trip that you're taking, weekly trip for your lessons. Lessons are being, are discussing the part of your journey you just took. Not having your teacher try to figure out why you don't sound so good and maybe it's because you didn't practice enough or maybe you didn't listen the week before and <laughs> try to do it the way your teacher said, you know, or whatever reason. But when you're on the same page as your teacher, you're going to see that your progress is really quicker because they can understand why things are happening because you keep either a good practice log or you, you explain what you did all week and you show your teacher what you experienced and they say, oh, yeah, well, try this. This is what, what I did when I did it. Well, all of a sudden, man, you're like, you're moving, you know? Yeah. But if you're coming in and you're really just trying to make your old technique work, huh, it's a slow process and it's not really fun for you. It's not fun for your teacher. So buy into what they say and give it a shot. Yeah, that's, that's great information. And uh, with teachers, you know, I, I've been blessed with amazing teachers because, you know, Steve Jones, Scott Thornburg, of course, Rich Illman, uh, you know, you and others. And um, it, it's funny that, I, you know, my advice to a lot of college students is, you know, really listen to your teachers because it took many years for me to really understand what they were trying to accomplish. And once I kind of uh, just took a step back and listened to what they're actually trying to teach me and suddenly everything started to make sense. Yeah. That's so important. You know, I didn't really take lessons until I went to college. So, you know, all my friends at Eastman, I mean, good heavens, Bill Collins, he sounded like he belonged in the New York Philharmonic when he came to Eastman. <laughs> you know, and I'm sitting next to him, I say, I don't sound like that. What's going on here? You know, well, it was shocking. You know, and uh, immediately I, I said, okay, whatever these guys are doing, that's what I'm doing. That's where I want to be. And, and uh, you know, so I was with a lot of these really fine, fine trumpet players. Marvin Perry, who played in Indianapolis until recently. I think he just retired a year or so ago. And he still subs in there and, you know, is happy. And, uh, you know, listening to all these people play on a, we on a daily basis in a lot of cases, you know, sit next to Lou Soloff for I don't know how many concerts I did with Lou. Wow, that was a trumpet lesson in itself. So... So get, get out there and play with people. And if you, even if you don't get to play with them, sit there and listen to what they're doing. And say, well, what, what is that they're doing? I'm going to learn how to do that. It gets you insight into another place to go, you know, and, and uh, you know, you're not, you're not working in a vacuum always, you know. Yeah. That's really good. And, I mean, people like Scott Thornburg and, I mean, Steve Jones, I mean, you talk about somebody who was meticulous. Yes, yes. <laughs> you had to be meticulous when you worked with him. And he was, very, he was very inquisitive. You know, most people don't know Steve because he's been gone quite a while now. And uh, uh, he would come up to me and say, Vince, you know, I was watching you. I'm going, why is he watching me? Man, this guy's like, forget it. He's, in, he's killing him. Great. And, you know, when you do this, it sounds really effortless in this area. What are you doing there? I'm going, ah, am I doing something? I mean, I, <laughs> it made me think about it. And, and, he was, and he would remember everything that he ever talked to you about and where it was, what it was, what piece it was. Boy, I tell you, that's, that's an amazing thing when you meet people like that. It makes you at least take more care with what you do yourself. Yeah. Gosh, I, I never really thought about anything like that. I'm a slug compared to this guy. Yeah. And I was. I mean, I didn't, it wasn't that I didn't practice. I did. But my practice habits were so lackadaisical. I, I'm surprised I got anywhere for a long time, you know? And I'm yeah. not gonna say I sounded bad because I didn't really sound bad. But I was limited in what I could do. You know, and I didn't want to be limited. I just figured if I just keep trying to play this kind of stuff, I'll get better at it. But I didn't. I had to change what I was doing. You know, so yeah. And I still love that. I still love it. I, I still go to master classes. I listen to every player. I don't care how old they are. I listen. I go, wow, they're obviously doing something that I'm not doing. So let me try to figure this out, how I can 
slide some of that into my playing because I think I could use a little bit of that in this type of piece or that type of piece. See, because then I find uses for music that they're not for the music they're playing, but for how they're playing their music. And I say, well, yeah, that would really work a lot better if I got that kind of a way of producing the sound when I did what I wanted to do with it. See, so yeah, so yeah, you, that's that's a lot of people make that mistake. They dismiss what other people are doing because they're not doing that. And so you miss all these opportunities to to grow and change. And that's uh, today, man. You got you got the whole world to listen to every day. Yeah. Wow. You go. You can say, well, I don't like that kind of music. Yeah, but that that guy was playing. I mean, don't you like that? I do. Listen to her. Oh my God, that's ridiculous. I don't know what that piece is, but I want to figure out how she's playing it. You know? Yeah. And that's that's what it's about. If you're not that inquisitive, you really don't want to learn to play better. You just kind of enjoy playing every day, and that's fine. But you can't get a, a better very fast that way. You're always, you know, studying in a very objective way. Don't get all worked up about it. You know, take notes if you want. My son Gabriel, I mean, he makes me look like a real slug. Because you go to his house and you open his, his closet where he keeps a lot of his trumpets. And all there are are these notebooks stacked in the closet. And I go, what is that, Gabriel? Oh, those are all my master class notebooks. What? Yeah, master class notebooks. I, I, I take master, I've got notes for all your master classes. You do? <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> so, yeah, and he goes, well, I go back over them sometimes. It's just because I remember there's something that you said that relates to what I'm doing. So I'll take it out. And I went, you know, Gitala's master class, and I was at this person's master class. He uses everybody's stuff. And when you talk to him, I'm going, I don't remember that, you know, but he says, yeah, yeah, I just looked it up, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was thinking about it and I couldn't remember which master class it was in. So I kind of went through a bunch of stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's fantastic. That's a, that's a real uh, person who's uh, in research. You know, he could be trying to find the cure for heart disease and he would do the same thing. Right. See, and the same thing with our trumpet playing. We have to be that extraordinary researcher with ourselves. We're looking inward by looking outward. And, and gosh, that's a great thing. It's so enlightening and it's humbling. And everybody needs a lot of humble. You know, there's a lot of people out there that could use a lot more of it, <laughs> you know? And I think, and, and that, that's not critical, it's just hopeful. You could use a lot more humble to get better. Oh my gosh. Some of the students I've had like at Interlochen are so humble and some of them are not. And usually the ones that are really humble and really in there, they're grasping at everything. Man, they move like lightning. Then all of a sudden you see, hey, that's that guy, he's on from the top. He was one of my students at Interlochen. Wow, isn't that cool? Oh, look, there's, there's Caleb. He was one of Rich's students, Rich, Rich Bird. Mm -hmm. He's in a Canadian brass. Wow. I mean, it happens because you, you pay attention. You pay attention and what? You're progressive in your thought, not what? Reactionary or regressive. You know, the word re means again, right? You know what I mean? Pro means forward, progressive, moving forward. And that's what we want. We want progressive thought. We, what do some of the books say? Progressive studies, right? Well, it says it. It's saying you're supposed to get progressively better at something in this book. Progressive rhythmic studies. Well, hell, that tells you. You're trying to progress in your rhythm. Develop sight reading by Roger Boisin and Gaston Dufresne, Dufresne, French. But that book, if you get to number 18 to 20 in that book, there's not much that's going to puzzle you when you look at a piece of music. 
So I always have all my students go up to number 18, at least. You know, so you, th so there's all these, it's very mechanical. You know, people say, oh yeah, you know, all that, yeah. I say, yeah, it's mechanical because it covers every aspect. There, there's a lot of detail in the, in, the, in the breadth of what we're learning to do. And that makes you the extraordinary person that you want to be. And yeah. That's everything. And, you know, and like I say, you know, I, I go try out a mouthpiece or I try out a horn. It's not just the ease of playing. It's relationship to music. I say, boy, if I had, whoa, wow, this is the sound that would work great in brass quintet. This is what I've been looking for. It's going to connect me to the horn. It's going to connect me to this. Or when I play ensemble, I'm going to have a more body to my sound so that I can add to the general breadth of sound and not just be the treble instrument, you know? So, so there's, you know, you're always thinking about what you can do better, you know? Especially as a, as a colleague in a group. If you're only thinking about yourself, you're going to end up out in left field somewhere, not really fitting in to anything except what you're hearing. Yeah. So basically, and a lot of people try to function like that. You know, they, they always, what's the word they always use? The China and the bull, the, the bull in the China shop. Yeah, because it, it, it's, it doesn't belong there. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you don't want a bull in the china shop. It wrecks the whole place. Well, sometimes it, they, people feel like that about some of us. You know, I'm sure sometimes people have said that about me. You know, but hopefully not too many times. <laughs> you know, so so that so you 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 know you're you're thinking about your job as being an asset always. So you're you're trying to find ways to be an asset to as many communities as you feel comfortable uh, being a part of. You know, that's also the success of your work uh, mm -hmm. as a musician. If you're going to work as a musician today, uh, you're not going to be playing in the, the local symphony and making a living unless it's the New York Philharmonic or the Chicago Symphony or one of the big 10 or 12 orchestras in this country. And even they have a hard time because there's always financial problems with those things. Yeah. But if you teach trumpet, you can play church jobs. Right? You can play big band jobs. You can play in the local symphony. You can play in the community band. You can play uh, in a brass quintet. You can, I mean, there's just so many. You can play small group things. You can improvise uh, with a jazz group. Uh, you can play polka band. Yeah, I mean, there's just a million things to do. And if you can do all of them fairly well, well, as the as the tide changes for certain groups, we don't have as many big bands anymore. My big band plays once a month. So if I was going to get paid, to, I don't get paid to do it. But if if the people that play it play in my band, we're counting on the forty to fifty dollars that they make playing in the big band once a month to live on. <laughs> maybe I wouldn't work too well. Yeah. And and so basically, you're teaching lessons and you're doing all these things, and before you know it. Without even holding a steady job, you're making thirty-five thousand dollars a year. Wow, that's pretty good. And then if you're teaching full time, all of a sudden now you're making seventy to eighty thousand dollars a year. Wow, I didn't think I could do that in Danville, Kentucky. Well, you almost could do that. Yeah. You know, if you travel just a little bit far in each direction, you could do it from Danville. So, so. You got to be really uh, aggressive in a good sense and find situations that you can be part of. And once again, be prepared, be ready. Because if you, somebody calls you to play in that brass quintet and you don't know what bangle sangle leader sounds like, well, if you don't know that one, there's a pretty good chance you're not going to know most of the brass quintet literature. So you're not going to be very useful for playing a sight reading job style wise even if you can play all the right notes. Right. So, so basically, see, that's where all of this study comes in is, is you, you know, it's like going to the grocery store and they have five things of cheese dip and you taste each one and then, well, that one's by far the best one. That's what I'm going to use. 
and the right. other four are on the shelf. Well, you don't want to be the one of those trumpet players that's on the shelf. You that's true. Be, you want to be the one that's chosen for the dip, for this, for that, and for that. <laughs> and then you're you're always in demand, so to speak. So you know that's that's the that's the challenge, and also that's the fun. Right. That's the fun. When music becomes boring, that's when it's time to watch soap operas, okay, <laughs> which are really boring. I don't see how anybody watches those. Yeah. Yeah. See, but that's that's the life. That's the life of of a musician or anybody who does anything at, at a very high level. Is that it's a challenge of expanding your horizons. And you are, you can't predict what the music is going to be in 20 years. Yeah. But if this is ready, it's ready to play that music. If this is not ready, you're going to have double trouble. You're going to have to learn that in music, and you're going to have to try to get this to try to play it. And usually it's not very successful when that happens. Usually your age will make you not want to do it or use it as an excuse for not to do it and or whatever. So so you want to make sure your trumpet I, every time I hear a new piece I even if I don't want to play it I say well let me let me see what that's like. Okay, my skills still work on that. You know, I'm still making sure that I could I could jump in there and if somebody gets sick, you know, that's a really important thing for me. For me it's important. If one of my good friends calls me they're playing with some symphony orchestra somewhere, a solo. And I get calls like this at least once a year. Vince, I'm sick. I, can't, I don't think I can get through this thing. Is there any way you, are you free like this weekend? So there's no time to practice the pieces. Yeah. And I'll say, I'll tell you what, let me see. I have one thing I can change. I did this once with, with Scott Hershey mm -hmm. one time. I don't do it often, but it was an important enough thing that I needed to do it for someone. And I got in my car and I drove there and I was ready to go. So see, that's, that's, that makes you feel extra good too, when you can help other people. So that's another important part. When you, when you, when you're going to your band rehearsals, you should be thinking that way. If you're not ready for the rehearsal, eh, people are not going to be real happy. You know. Yeah. You become well, then you become See. shelf material. <laughs> like I said so you don't want to be shelf material. You want to be an asset that makes the level of whatever group you're playing with stay at a certain level or go higher. You don't want to be the person dragging down the group. I mean, band directors talk about that all the time. Man, you're dragging the whole band down. You haven't learned that part. We've been trying to get you to learn that one eight bar phrase and you can't, you haven't done it enough. You haven't practiced enough. You haven't practiced your instrument enough. You haven't practiced the music enough. And now we're a week before solo and ensembles and you, and you can't play it. I hope you learn it. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, and it's the same way if, you know, I, I assign you to these uh, uh, 10 income taxes to do for this person. Man, it's two days before income tax and you're not done. You better stay up all night and get it done or you won't be working here anymore. Right. Yeah. Same thing. You know, it's not different. That's what another reason for practicing is you meet deadlines. You meet deadlines. This is the same deadline as doing those 10 tax returns. It's the same deadline as learning to accompany somebody on their jury. It's the same one that you use to be part of some company uh, that you're you're in a design team for and you haven't done your part of the design. So as a result, you can't put the bid in and you can't win the contract. And then you're, you're gone, okay? Because you lost uh, $5 million to the company. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you know, this isn't quite maybe as important in some respects, but the, the uh, what it teaches you is to meet deadlines, is to be disciplined and to work hard to the nth degree so you can find out what you can do. So for me, that's all it is. And, and also, I, I just, I like the challenge. 
I like the challenge of getting up and trying to play at a certain level every day, even if yeah. I don't have a job. I mean, it doesn't matter. When I come to, to picket brass and blackburn trumpets, I'm, I'm at that level, and I'm looking. Maybe there's a little thing they can do for me that's going to make me feel even better. I'm not looking for them to, to fix me. I got to do that. I got <laughs> Yeah, I get, you know, I'm not that uh, stupid, uh, but but if I can, if I say, well, gee, you know, if I blow the way I'm blowing and I use this mouthpiece, heck, this is a lot easier. Now, I don't even have to know what it is, you know, and hopefully you don't get the what? The 10 day mouthpiece crash. <laughs> Maybe it was just, a, but then we fix it. We go back yeah, right. work and we start again. You know, and so it's exciting to be part of anything where it's progressive, you know. Look at what we're going through now in the country. There's a reason we're home because people are stymied by this, you know, situation, this whole disease. It's something they've never experienced. It's They've never had one that moved this way. They've never had one that did this, that they can't predict this and this and this. So everything is stopped because of that. Because if they don't stop, bad things are happening. Yeah. So, so basically, but the process is so exciting for these people. I mean, they're not happy that they have this process, but they're using those skills that they have. That is an invigorating thing. That's what this is. It's invigorating. When I can play a piece of music that somebody's written and make it come alive because I've practiced this to a certain degree to do certain types of things, I know those people are happy. And usually the audience is really excited. So we're doing a, a wonderful thing together, all of us, the audience, the composer, the musicians, the conductor, you know. So, so that's the way I look at it. I'm lucky to be part. And great, it's great because... Maybe other people don't understand each other when they go to a different country, but I do. All I have to learn is the letters and the numbers, and I can rehearse. Sound is sound. Yeah. People understand emotion and sound and rhythm and everything else. And, wow, it's great to go to different countries. You make immediate friends with people. It's like, it's like glue. You know, so basically, and when you when you meet people like that that are in your profession, it's the same. You meet an architect that is as passionate about architecture as you are, and wow, you know, I saw this building that you designed. Oh my gosh, we really need to talk about that. That's I can't even figure out what you did. You know, it's. It's exciting. But if you say, well, that's not the kind of building I design. Well, you've cut off a, an experience for yourself. Yeah. And there's a lot of musicians like that, too. They do that. You know, it's they too worry about being inferior, inferior or something because yeah. you know, design it. So, but any more questions? More questions? I, uh, let's see. Uh, I think we got, um, oh, there, oh, there is a question that is not trumpet related. They want to know what is for dinner. Ah. Tonight, what are you going to make for dinner? It's takeout Tuesday, right? Oh. So I made, for lunch today, I made uh, a vegetable dish with codfish in the middle with uh, saffron that I was given by uh, a band where most of the saffron in the world is made in Kozani, Greece. I just got back from there in January. And I took some of that saffron and, and mixed it in there. And the most important thing is that Patty loved it. So that's There you go. <laughs> so I cook most meals. And I, I'll probably cook tonight, but if I do, I don't, I don't, uh, I have to go up to the refrigerator. And I, I don't, actually, I just look at the refrigerator. I open the doors. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're having tomatoes for sure. Thank you. Uh, got a pork chop. Okay, pork chops are good. We have pork chops and tomatoes and Brussels sprouts. That's it. Then I'm ready. 
and takes a half hour to do that. That's it. So I take my trumpet up, usually. And I, actually, I play, I play the hardest things soft, usually. So I'll play. Great. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have to rest too long. Get the uh, mouth. Oh, okay. That's why. Wrong mouthpiece. Out. Let's at the uh, Lincoln Portrait. Mm -hmm. That's the hardest solo. You're playing loud, loud. You know, you're playing high A's on the C trumpet and stuff like that, or, or G's and A's. And then everything just kind of clears and melts away. And the trumpet comes in and plays that alone through the strings. <laughs> right? When Phil Collins played that the first time, when I, I was standing backstage because that was the uh, the end of the first half was uh, Story Musgrave, who was a, an astronaut, was the narrator. He did an excellent job. And I hadn't heard the piece in a long time, you know, I just, you know, just hadn't listened to that. And I was standing backstage and Phil was probably about maybe 10 feet at most from me, because he couldn't see me, but I could, you know, I was that close to him. And he started playing and I, I started crying because it was so beautiful. It was the most effortless floating sound that I think I ever heard on a trumpet. And, he, and it was funny because he came off and he goes, what's the matter? I said, Phil, that was the most beautiful thing I've ever heard anyone play on a trumpet. And he says, yeah, you're playing. He didn't even know what to say, <laughs> you know, because it was, it was so beautiful. So I play. I try to play things that are really challenging to me after playing a long time. You know, so, that, so yeah. you're always practicing that way. You're practicing for the worst case scenario, you know. And, and and so you're using the time you're waiting for the spaghetti to get ready. You got nine to eleven minutes. You can do a lot of practicing in nine minutes while you're sitting around, you know, or you can watch the bad news. You know, you can watch it over again. Now that now they have twenty four hour news, all they do is keep replaying the same stuff over and over again. So what yeah. are saying at all? You know, used to be news was what? Half hour in the morning, half hour at night. And some people had noon news. So you had an hour and a half of news a day. That was it. It was pretty succinct. Everything was right to the point. You didn't have talking heads. You didn't have any of those people. I could do it better than you, or you know, you didn't have any. Yeah. So, so uh, people, you know, interacted more with those things off camera, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. So you know. So anyway. That's cool. Well, you know, Vince, I appreciate all your time, and you know, we'll do this again. And uh, you know, it's good to see you're safe and everyone's safe out there. And. Yes. Um, See, watch my uh, watch my little thing on my my Facebook page. Which one? Stay home. Oh, I, I did see that one. <laughs> That's good. I had Clint Eastwood in the backward in the back of me. That's good. That's cool. <laughs> All right, well, Vince, I appreciate it, and uh, you, you, Patty, stay safe, and we'll catch up as soon as this craziness is done. I'll see you at the place. Yes, you will. Well, at McGee's first. Oh. Then yes, we, yes. Then we move over to mouthpieces and horns. That's true. The warm up. That's we had to do that other warm up. All right, Vince. We'll take care. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everybody for watching. Bye bye.